on the verge of war with France and the X, Y, Z affair. Okay? Now, I mentioned yesterday to you that President Adams was not very pleased to have a Republican vice president, I can assure you, but he really had little time to worry about it because by the time Adams took the oath of office as president, the United States was being threatened with war from France. Okay? And there were two reasons why France was mad at the United States and were threatening war. Anybody think about, from what we've talked about, why France might have a bone to pick with the United States, Cassie? Absolutely. Very good, my dear. They still resented America's refusal to abide by the Treaty of 1778. Remember that we talked about that? We wouldn't do that. President Washington wanted to remain neutral. And the French even sent diplomats over saying, listen, you signed this treaty in 1778. We signed it with you at your favor so we could help you during the Revolutionary War and now you're backing out on us. So the French still resented the fact that they had come to the aid of the colonists during the latter stages of the Revolutionary War and then we kind of were disloyal to them when, we, when they needed our help. So the first reason why the United States was being threatened with war from France is that France resented America's refusal to abide by the Treaty of 1778. What else did America do during that time that has a little bit to do with it, maybe, that would cause France to be mad? Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh. Uh, we uh, made peace with France. And what was that peace called? You're right there. The but what was it called? What was that peace? No, that was where, you're getting closer, you're doing good here, girl, because the proclamation of neutrality wasn't that Washington, but we, she's right, we went over and made peace with Great Britain, and we gave them everything, didn't we? Gave them the right to trade fur in our uh, western lands, we let them open the ports to all of our ships. What was that treaty called? John, John Jay. Jay's Treaty, very good, very good. So the second reason why France was threatening war with the United States is they resented Jay's Treaty, which they definitely saw as pro-British. Okay, so those are the two reasons why, when President Adams takes over the presidency, he's faced with a possible war with France because France is mad at the United States. One for not abiding by the Treaty of 1778. When they needed our help, we didn't give it to them. But when we needed their help, they were there. And the second reason they were mad is because we signed the Jay's Treaty, which was so pro-British, it was unbelievable. So we were supporting Britain instead of them. They were mad. So we got problems. Okay? And what Adams wants to do is he wants to try to negotiate peace between the United States and France because he doesn't want to go to war because we still are weak and can't afford to do that. We can easily be taken over. So what's he going to do to try to make peace? He's going to send three American diplomats over to France to try to negotiate peace. Just so happens that one of those diplomats, William, is James Monroe, who's going to later become an American president. Okay? So, President Adams sends three American diplomats over to France, including James Monroe, who will turn out to be an eventual president, and they're to meet and try to make peace with France, because President Adams does not want to go to war. So, President Adams, to avoid war, sends three American diplomats to France to reach an agreement with that country to avoid war, including a man by the name of James Monroe, who's on your ID sheet, who turns out to be a president of the United States. Well, when Monroe and these other two diplomats arrive in France, they were met privately by three French diplomats. Okay? So in these three American diplomats, Monroe and his two sidekicks, so to speak, go to France, they then meet privately with these three French diplomats. Anybody want to guess what the three French diplomats' names were? Go take a look. Paint, paint a little bit. They would only give their names as... I think... No? Think, yeah. No? Think about it. Now watch your... What? X, Y, and Z. Thus, X, Y, Z affair. So, when these American diplomats arrived in France and were met privately by these three French diplomats, they would only identify themselves as X, 
Y, and Z. Okay, they would not identify themselves other than that. Well, right away, are you thinking if you're an American diplomat, this isn't going real good, right? Because they're thinking that these French have all the cards. Do they hold all the cards? Because we're the one that wants to avoid war, right? Well, what these French diplomats do, X, Y, and Z, is they gave these three American representatives two, and I put it on, is it on your ID sheet, ultimatums? Is it on your sheet? No, nope, I'm going to put it on the board and it should be. Ultimatums. Make sure you know what this is. So, these three French diplomats, X, Y, and Z, gave the three American diplomats, including James Monroe, two ultimatums. Ultimatums. William, if you don't write that down, I'm going to cut off your left arm. Okay, I'm making a point. You know what that is when I say that to you? That's an ultimatum. You do this or else. I made a point there. He had already had it written down. Look at that, right? But that's an ultimatum. Brody, if you don't come tomorrow with six cases of Diet Pepsi for me, I'm going to flunk you no matter what grade you get in that class. That's an ultimatum. It's kind of unreasonable, isn't it? Okay, it's unreasonable. Okay, it's, we talk about unreasonable versus uncomfortable. That's unreasonable. Okay, to say to William, if you don't write, the, if they don't have this on your notes, I'm going to come over and cut off your right arm. That's unreasonable. That's an ultimatum. There's no back either. Does it or else? There's no negotiation. So they're going over there to negotiate peace, and what are they getting in return? Ultimatums. Well, here are the two ultimatums that they were told. You will, the United States will give a loan to France. But now I'm going to go buy a new four-wheeler, and I want to borrow money from Gil McKendry. Do I go up to Gil Padilla and say, listen, McKendry, you're loaning me that money, and you're not charging me any interest, and I'm not paying you back for 10 years. Is that? And he's going to say, oh, sure, Mr. Durr, you can have this loan, right? He's going to tell me to get probably get somebody to escort me out of the bank, okay? So you don't want to give ultimatums to people because they get upset. So if they say to the United States, you will grant us a loan, that's an ultimatum. We may not want to do that. Well, you don't have any choice. If you Here's the ultimatum. If you don't grab me the loan, Brad, uh, Branson, what's going to happen? We're going to war. You don't want to go. That's an ultimatum, okay? So that was the first ultimatum that these French diplomats gave the American representatives, that the United States must grant a loan to France. Now, I'm going to get back to Brody, because their second ultimatum was about what I said. I said to Brody, if you don't give me 250, if you don't give me six cases of Diet Pepsi, if you don't give me $250,000, then I'm going to give you an F in this class, then I'm going to go to war with you. So what France said is, you will give us $250,000, and if you do not give us that money, we are going to go to war. First one is they said you're going to grant us a loan. Well, how much? Oh, I don't. Substantial. Or they wouldn't get what's the loan. The first one was they demanded a loan. They demand a loan, a lot of money, and they knew we wouldn't give them a lot of money for nothing. But they knew they might, they might, we might give them two hundred fifty thousand. See what I mean? So they said you must grant us a loan, and you must give us two hundred fifty thousand dollars, or we're going to war. So it's not the same part. It's they're going to get a loan that they'll pay back, and then the other part they just want money. With no yeah, money. and I'm not sure they had too close to terms on how they were going to pay that back. They were just demanding a loan. The loans, a loan you pay back. I don't know what the terms were. But the other part was you're going to loan us this big amount of money, whether you like it or not, and then you're just going to give us $250,000 to kind of get started. So I can go to the bank and say, you know, McKendry, here's what you're going to do. You're going to loan me $100,000. Okay, but I want you to give me $25,000 right now so I can spend it on something else, some tires for whatever I buy. I mean, that, he'd kick you out of the office, wouldn't he? So this is, what, this is what the United States has to listen to, and then they got to take this back to John Adams, the president, and tell him how the negotiations went, <laughs> right? Well, what did we do when, when, when President Adams found out the results of the meeting between the three French diplomats and the three American diplomats, once he got that information, what did he do? He prepared the United States of America for war. war. Okay? They started building warships, they started to fortify their harbors, they started strengthening their army, all of those types of things. So when President Adams gets the word back of the results of the negotiation that went on in France, 
the United States of America starts to make war preparations. They start building warships, right? They start fortifying our harbors, defending our harbors in case the French would come over, come over and attack us on our own soil. Has that ever happened? Have we ever had somebody come over and attack us on our own soil? Twice. Anybody remember what it was in history? Twice. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor? Yeah. 17 years ago today, 9-11. Okay? That's the only two times in American history we have been attacked on our own soil. Think about that. So they fortified their harbors, the United States did, thinking that France was going to come and attack. Okay? And they also started strengthening their army. So we figured out, you know, we better get our stuff together. And we're going to go to war with France, there's no question. Nothing's going to stop it. And we're going to get our butts kicked. And we're all speaking French now instead of American. That's kind of the thought process. Well, we get the break of the century. The United States gets this unbelievable lucky break. And you know what that break was? A fellow by the name of Napoleon overthrew the French government and made himself dictator. So between the time that we had that poor meeting in France and it was, we were preparing for war, thinking it was going to be disastrous, all of a sudden in history, Napoleon overthrows the French government revolutionist by the name of Napoleon overthrows the French government and makes himself dictator. So, just when we think we're going to war, a revolutionist by the name of Napoleon overthrows the French government and makes himself dictator. He do that all by himself. Obviously, he had a lot of people that were unhappy in <coughs> France, that were unhappy about the things and ways that things were being run. Therefore, they had a revolution within France, and Napoleon led it, and when they won the revolution, he made himself dictator. Now, dictator is a different term than president. When you're a dictator, you run what we call a totalitarian government, where you will press people's rights. They have no rights. You tell people what to do, almost like an ultimatum, and they either do what you say, or there's harsh consequences, sometimes even death. So when you're a dictator, the government says everything, you have no vote, dictator, the government makes all the rules and you either live with them or you be subversive to those or there's a consequence. Usually the consequence was bad. Okay? But in, in this instance, Napoleon taking over was a huge break for the United States because what he wanted to do, if you, if you overthrew another country, would your, would your first thought be, yeah, I want to get wars with all these people in Europe? No, you want to have time to get your reign going. The last thing he wanted was conflict with any countries at all. So when he overthrew France, he was very eager to reach a settlement with the United States and Great Britain and whoever because he didn't want to go to war right away with another country. Now those countries that supported the French government as it was, which was not many, to be honest with you, would have been upset and maybe gave him some distance. But in, in, in essence, a lot of people were relieved in Europe that he did overthrow the French government until he decided he was going to conquer all of Europe sometime. We'll get into that later. Okay? So, what would be the one thing that Napoleon and the United States could agree to that would solve all problems between them? What's still out there in the balance has never been dissolved. What? Uh, you dissolve the treaty? The treaty of 1778 had never been dissolved. So the first thing Napoleon did concerning the United States after the revolution is he disbanded or got rid of or threw out the Treaty of 1778 so the United States could never have that thrown in their face any longer, okay, that they weren't abiding by it because it didn't exist, okay? So again, I'll go through this again. At the verge of war with France, the United States gets a break when the country of France was overthrown by a revolutionist by the name of Napoleon. Napoleon and his followers had overthrown the French government and he made himself dictator. He wanted to begin his reign of France free from conflict of other countries, and as a result, he was very eager to reach an agreement with the United States. So the, Napoleon and the United States agreed to abandon the Treaty of 1778, and by working this out with Napoleon, President Adams avoided a full-scale war with France. Okay? All right. What's, what's tomorrow? Thursday? Okay, I want you to write down the top of your notes the election of 1800. The election, we'll get, get kind of ready for tomorrow. The election of 1800.
and I'm going to give you the candidates and then we'll stop and have ice cream, okay? So here are the candidates. The election of 1800. Again, both the Federalist and Republican parties are going to meet to nominate their candidates for the presidency and vice presidency. And the Federalists chose President Adams to run again. Okay, he was their candidate, so he would be running for re-election. John Adams. So John Adams will be the presidential candidate for the Federalists. John Adams. And he nominates another Pinckney, only this time Charles C. Pinckney, as vice president. So for the, for the Federalist Party, they're going to pick President Adams for re-election for a second term for president. But the vice presidential candidate's going to change. It's going to be Charles C. Pinckney. They are. Now, Republicans don't change anything. That means that they nominate who for president? Thomas Jefferson. Who for vice president? Aaron Burr. Okay. When they tabulated the votes, Adams had the most. Adams had the most. Oh, no. What's that? Yeah. Well, 70. No, I'm going to tell you how many he had. Okay? 71. No, I'm going to tell you that in a minute. <laughs> Okay, Adams wins the election. What's the key next? Who's the vice president? Yeah, well guess what? Thomas Jefferson gets 73 votes. Aaron Burr gets 73 votes. We have a tie for the vice presidency. And tomorrow, I'm going to tell you how you break a tie still today. War. I don't know. I can look it up. He had more than 73. Right? So John Adams wins the election, but Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr both received the same number of electoral votes, 73. No, no, listen up. Listen up. Hey, start over. Because I was thinking, when you asked me that, you threw me off. The bottom line is, is Thomas Jefferson Aaron Burr, Thomas Jefferson Aaron Burr tied with 73 for what? For the presidency. Yeah, for the presidency. Adams was not in the top two. That's right, screwed up. You got me kind of confused. I apologize. So when you... So, just a second. So, when the election results were tabulated, Jefferson and Burr both received the same number of electoral votes, 73. So, they're not deciding who's going to be vice president. Well, they are. They're deciding what? Who's going to be president and vice president? Because you have a tie for the presidency, right? Tomorrow, we'll tell you how they broke that tie. Okay? So, we have no president at this point. Okay? All right. Screw that up a little bit. All right. You guys get things put away. I'll be back in a minute with some treats. So, did you end up getting chocolate or something?